Hello, everybody. My name is Emiliano Topete. Back in 2019, I did a presentation for Maxon at Seagraph. And a few weeks later, Roy Acavia, one of the showrunners of a production company called Sugar 2020, reached out to me to make with our Cinema 40 production pipeline a 12 minute pilot episode for a show they were developing. And I will let Roy take it from here. Thank you, Emiliano. Hi, everybody. My name is Roy Acavia. I'm an artist, animator, and director of animation. Two years ago, I found I have diabetes number two. My wife, as a doctor, recommend me to do diet, obviously, and exercise. And I start doing it, and I lost weight, and I don't take pills anymore. Then she tell me, why you don't do a TV series about sugar, about the evil of sugar? So, okay. I connect my partner, Roberto Mitrotti. He's a writer and film director in, uh, he lives in Hollywood and I introduced him this idea and he liked it and we start working together, creating a concept. And uh, after a while, reading appear by his hands and we have now a script and a storyline. I work on the characters in the same time and I come with a concept of characters. I connect Ricardo Curia. He is a concept artist. He brought the drawing to the level of animation and presentation that are very, very beautiful. And now I need a production company. So I look into the internet and in SIGA of 2019, I see the presentation of Emiliano Topete his company called Pulligan, and I say, wow, this is very, very interesting. I like the way he do the rig, by the way. Then I say, wow, Cinema 4D is interesting. Uh, I used to do Cinema 4D in 2006, when I used to do Cinema, when I used to do Unity 3D, those days I used to do platform for Second Life, the gaming system, right? But for me to direct my thoughts, what can be better than a wire comb and a, and a pencil, right? So I use the doodle. Doodle! Amazing for our director or to anybody that is a group that work together. So I'm able to draw in the perspective on the side, on the front, a direct camera position to layouts, position of the characters, so I achieve a lot by working from Japan <laughs> with Mexico. <laughs> we did good. I have to walk up at three o'clock in the morning every day, but this is okay. Uh, we have a great presentation now. So I hope you enjoy it. Uh, this is a sizzler. And you up there, if you have something to share and you want to connect me, please do. Until the next time, uh, Happy New Year and uh, keep creating Cinema 4D is great. So, thank you. Bye bye. Taste good, Miss Marshmallow? <laughs>
a motorcycle, a train, a helicopter, and tons of BFX. And on top of that, we had the pandemic. Uh, here in the studio, we had developed projects with three or four characters in a simple layout. So I wasn't completely sure of how Cinema 4D was going to handle something as big as this. And let me tell you straight off, it was amazing. We had a fast and efficient animation workflow and a flawless post-production pipeline. So today I want to share with you nine tips that I consider are were the most valuable of the production. So let's start with three rigging tips. Number one, understanding the object manager. What? The object manager, he said? No explosions or cool effects? Knowing how the object manager works is the one thing I wish I had known back when I started using Cinema 4D 15 years ago. The object manager has a reading sequence from top to bottom and left to right. If you organize the objects in your file, keeping this very simple principle in mind, you can get away with anything your heart desires. Okay, so this is a file of a character in the show. And as you can see, we have organized everything into these five groups. And this sequence was really proven to be flawless thanks to this production. So let's go ahead and dissect how this object manager is working. So the first thing that you want your, your Cinema 4D to read is your spline group. Through a lot of years of studying and using Cinema, we have found that it's very convenient to build beneath the system of joints of a character a system of splines. And this is due to the fact that splines will allow you to get away with limbering sensations in animation. As you can see, I can break the elbow joint and this will result in very interesting in-betweens in the animation process. So the way that this is working is that cinema will start reading here at the top until it arrives and reads this spline that we have called the left arm spline. And Cinema will read this, understand it, and it will send this information downstream, sort of speaking, until it reaches this chain of joints that are driving the left arm. Specifically, this tag called an IK spline tag, that is the responsible one for creating a link between this spline and the chain of joints. So as you can see, the riggers have dropped this object into this field, and the fact that the object manager has already read this object will guarantee that Cinema will know exactly how to solve this tag. I have seen a lot of tutorials where people overcomplicate things using this priority parameter, but it is really not necessary if you just keep in mind this very simple logic. Now we have found that this was true for all tags in Cinema except for one, which is the Expresso tag. Uh, we learned that the objects that were contained inside of this tag, it wasn't necessary for them to have been previously read by the object manager uh, in order for this tag to be correctly solved. So what we decided to do is just to group all of the expressos here on the top of our object manager and this helped us to avoid later on any conflict between the expressos and the rest of the tags that we were going to build uh, in the rig. So as you can see, this is our third group, which is the rig itself, and I cannot go into a lot of detail, but I would like to recommend you to study a lot out of this character object that you can find in the character menu. We have taken a lot of very good ideas out of studying how this object is built. Now, our fourth group is the animation group, and it contains this object selection object that if you were to double click in any of them, uh, you can have a selection of multiple controllers. And this is very useful for animators in the animation process. And our final group is the meshes of the character, and we have organized it into two groups the features of the character, which are the cloth, the hair, or any prop of the character. And finally, the body group, which contains the mesh of the body of the character. And as you can see, this is the last object on our list. 
And the way that we understand this is that every single null joint or tag that you build inside of your object manager will send all this information down until it reaches this object that ultimately is the object that is going to get animated. This is an example of a scene handed out to an animator. As you can see, it has five characters and a fairly complex layout. So here we came along with a specific order for things to be read as well in the object manager. This is the way that we managed to build a fast, efficient, and mostly stable animation workflow for the animators. Keep in mind that some of them had never used Cinema 4D before, and thanks to the pandemic, they were working at home, sometimes in laptops. So I guess it all comes down to a very simple example. Let's right click on this cube and go down to rigging tags and hit constraints. I'm going to check PSR. Most of the tags in Cinema 4D have fields on them and you can drag and drop objects to those fields. The only thing that you have to make sure of and understand is that those objects have to be on top and to the left of that tag. And if you keep this very simple logic in mind, you won't run into any troubles whatsoever. The second thing I want to say to the riggers out there is don't be afraid of adding complexity to your object manager. Uh, I remember when I first started using Cinema 4D and rigging, uh, I remember looking at these gigantic lists in the object manager and thinking, you know what, there must be a simpler way of doing this. And uh, for many years, what happened was that we were left up with very simple uh, rigs. So for example, here we have the rig of the, of the fingers. And this is what we had up until 2019. We just had like a, this FK system built into the fingers. And we could do something like this. And if we needed to, to play around with, with individual fingers, we would just uh, control, uh, select the controller and move it around. But then when I came back from Seagraph, some of the riggers told me, okay, so we, we should keep this, this um, rig definitely, but we could add on top of that this other rig that will um, let us to, to do very complex stuff in animation. So what we did here is we built a little bit of complexity into the hierarchy of each finger. And it's just some nodes and that are connected to, to, this, to the attributes of this controller right here and this sphere and uh, through an expresso. So let me show you the expresso. It must be this one over here. And as you can see, just the certain attributes of that sphere are moving the rotations of those nulls in the fingers. And this allows you to, as an animator, to select this controller and with no time whatsoever, you can get away with amazing poses for the fingers. So once again, do not be afraid of adding complexity into your object manager. Let me tell you about this place. Color coding and customizing. Surprisingly, one of the things that people uh, were asking about uh, from my Seagraph presentation was how did we manage to do all this user data with all these colors and sliders? And uh, it is very simple. I'm going to make a new new file, and uh, the thing here in Cinema 4D is that you can you can grab any attribute. Uh, let's grab the size X and right click and say add to HUD. I'm going to hold the Control key and drag this over here, and then you just have to right click and in display. What we do is we go for the icon so that we get the icon and this allows us as well in display to play with the icon size and we say large and this already looks better for an animator and we just to color things up and we put here a background and and go for for a color and this is the way that that is done Okay, so all you riggers out there know that 
using colors keeps you from going insane when it comes to rigging and um, here in the studio we we love using colors that you have, you have seen here in this presentation and uh, when back before R21 came along uh, we used to to do our controllers of, of every character with knots and this was because of the fact that knots had the, the possibility of using color in their icons where splines couldn't. Let me show you um, this more clearly here in the object manager. So I'm going to right click and say unfold all and I'm going to hit this lantern over here so that I can filter out only the notes. So hitting the control key in my keyboard I'm going to click on this eye icon and I will see only the notes of the object manager and as you can see well there's a very strong relationship between what you see in the viewport and what you see in the object manager and this is well just a blessing as a rigger um, but there are times when you need uh, controllers not to be nulls but to be uh, spline because of the fact that for example here in the head controller uh, if you use a null, the mesh of the character would mm, block the visibility of that controller. So it comes very in handy to have a spline for the head controller. But we didn't like the idea of not having a color for the spline uh, icon here in the, in the object manager. But now let me show you, I'm going to hold the option key in my keyboard and hit that eye icon and hit it again so that I can now uh, filter uh, again everything to normal. And as you can see here in the splines, we have the possibility of seeing the colors. I'm going to get rid of the visibility of the meshes and of the rig as well so that you can see my splines. Here they are. And everything has a lot of colors and it's very understandable for you and for your team. And uh, well, another thing that came along with Cinema R21 was the fact that you could use these very interesting icons uh, in your rig. And the only thing that you have to do here is you have to go to the Attributes Manager and on the Basic tab you can load any of these presets that cinema has, or you can do your own. For this next tip, I have to make a shout out to Orestis Konstantinidis uh, back in the Maxon headquarters in Germany, for he showed me this very, very cool tip. This is an example of a scene that was handed to an animator back when we do, were doing the production. And uh, this is the way that we have set up a file for animation. So as you can see in the left, we can see what the what the render is going to to be rendering, and on the right, uh, the the animator can select controllers and animate. Um, so what I asked uh, Orestes was if there was a way of filtering out from this view the controllers. Because if you go to filter and you get rid of the nulls and the splines, which are the, the controllers that we have made in our rig, we would lose them here in our render view, but we would also lose them in this uh, other viewport, which we need them to work with. So what he told me is this. Uh, you have to go to options and then to configure. And here in the configure attributes manager, of this viewport, you have to right click on the null filter and say uh, make parameter local. And we're going to do the same for the splines. And now, as you can see, we can get rid of the nulls and we can get rid of the splines here in the render view, but we can still have them in this other viewport and we can work without any trouble for the, uh, for the animators. Is he, Papito? That boy looks like my son. Very handsome. One last rig tip. 
Uh, okay, so in this project we found that for squashing and stretching, it was more convenient not to use the squash and stretch deformer that we had used in previous projects, but the freeform deformer. And let me show you the difference. Uh, if I go to my layer manager and bring my secondary controllers to a visibility, I have this controller over here, this cross on top of Arlo's head, and what squash and stretch allows you to do is to pull down and up in the y-axis a certain object, but um, the freeform deformer allows you to go into different directions, and this has like a more organic feeling to it, like a He-Man doll. And the, the rig behind this is uh, very simple, actually. Uh, I'm going to bring into my object manager my deformers and my meshes, and I'm going to unlock them. And I'm going to click on the visibility of my deformers. And here on the bottom of my object manager, we can find our freeform deformer. If I double click on this tag, which is the weights tag, we see that we can paint weights to the points of a freeform deformer. And these points have been painted to this little joint over here. And if I hit N and G, so that I can see here, on the bottom part of that freeform deformer, I have this other joint. And the, the bottom uh, points of the freeform deformer have been weighted to this other joint. So in this way, if there is a change in the position of them, uh, that's how these points move. Now, there is a thing that I have to mention that uh, was like the tricky part of this rig, is that we don't only have to change the position of those joints, we have to change the scale so that it squashes and stretches. So for this, we made this very clever expresso that calculates the distance between those two joints and uh, here we have a distance of 50 and it's just a simple division uh, with this value of 50 in the other input and if this distance changes then the result will change uh, to 1 to something uh, bigger or smaller than 1 and in this way the scales, the x and y and c of the, of the joints will change and we will have this squash and stretch feeling to it. MoGraph to the rescue. I want to show you uh, how our MoGraph background allowed us to troubleshoot three very difficult script requirements. Okay, so first off, let's start with Roberta and her transformation from a bird to a robot. This cute character, of course, of course represented a huge challenge because of this transformation. And uh, so we went to our MoGraph skills and what we figured out was the following. Uh, the rig of the wings, of course, is very simple. It's just an FK that moves them uh, like this and the rig of the head this as well just an FK that moves ahead like that. But the, the difficult part, the challenging part, was how to transform this uh, from uh, one to another. So what we figured out was the following. Let me change this to a subdivision version so that you can see it more clearly. And so what we figured out was the following. Let me bring my deformers and my meshes to my object manager. And let me unlock them so that we can see them. And uh, as you can see, I grouped uh, in uh, null a head for the robot, and I grouped in this other null uh, all the all the objects that make up for the head of the animal of the bird. And uh, inside of those nulls, I placed a plane effector. And what that plane effector is doing in its parameters, it's scaling all the faces of those uh, objects down. So let me show you how this works. I'm going to bring my secondary controllers. I'm going to select the controller and bring it uh, close to the body. And you can see that the wing transforms from bird to robot. And the same for the head. If I were to pull this down on the y-axis, it would transform to a robot. So um, 
And the way that this is working is that this plane effector has on the fall off a direction of y plus and the plane effector of the robot has y minus and this is how when one transforms in the other transforms out and other thing that it's uh, well I have to mention is that uh, it is um, necessary to have this poly effects which you can find here in the MoGraph menu because this poly effects what it will do is that it will recognize each polygon of the geometry as if it were a cloner and that's the way that we can break those apart and now to finish you may be asking where well are the actual fields the object of fields we conveniently just parented them uh, here in the in the head controller we created the, the the controller of the transformation and as a child of that controller we put the linear field of the robot head and the linear field of the animal head and just like that we uh, we managed to to pull out this very difficult script requirement who are these guys who hate me so much Okay, so let's continue with more MoGraph tools for you, for all you MoGraph junkies. Um, so you may be familiar with the sound effector, and the sound effector, of course, is, is one of the coolest things in, in MoGraph because it allows you to let me very quickly make a setup for a sound effector. I'm going to put a sphere into a null object, into a, sorry, into a cloner object and I'm going to make a child of it and I'm going to just very quickly transform that into a grid array and maybe pull this to three and now uh, having the cloner selected I'm going to MoGraph, Effector and Sound Effector and here in the Sound Effector I have a field and I can load any sound that I want so um, now if I were to hit play Get up, you here it doesn't happen but if I just move this where the waveforms of this clip is is actually happening okay, okay. we can have this Get up, you okay, okay. so what we did is the following we had this um, with with this scene and uh, we handed to the animator just the the robots and the the set and the characters and when they sent us back the scene, the only thing that we had to do for, for the robots to have this movement, sort of a speaker movement to their, uh, to their mouths, as you can see there, like these old speakers moving, like pumping in and out. Uh, the only thing that we had to do is we, in that piece of geometry, that is uh, the head, we made, we made a sound effector, uh, a child. The only thing that you have to keep in mind here is that in, inside of the former, you have to change the deformation to polygon. And that's it. In this way, the, the deformer will treat a geometry as clones. Um, so uh, the only thing that we have to do here is inside of the of the parameter we have to put some sort of movement in this case C I just placed two centimeters and here we can load the sound I'm going to load a wave sound and uh, and that's it uh, once I hit play as you can see the the geometry is being affected and uh, one last thing that I have to mention is that I did have to make a um, this tag, which is a, a weight tag, a weight selection tag, that will allow for some of the of the polygons to be affected and other points not to be, and this way we were able of figuring out this uh, this issue of the speakers of the robots. Get up, you schmucky toki. For the robot's eyes, um, Roy and Roberto sent us this reference of how they wanted the eyes to, to look. 
and the robot's eyes had to be this sort of very cool um, uh, reference that, that they sent us. And so when we saw this, we, we instantly thought of, of making a, a cloner object and play around with the visibility of the clones with a plane effector. And uh, it worked just beautifully. And so let me show you. Uh, here we have the, the character. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, to subdivide it so that we can see it more clearly. And uh, for the eyes, we created this uh, controller. And if we move it uh, around, uh, the pupil of the robot would move uh, in the same fashion that the reference does. Uh, and not only that, this controller has some user data that when you uh, bring this slider to the, to the right, you could have a blink. And as you can see, it also matches the way that the reference moves. So the way that we did this uh, was the following. We, uh, let me go to my layer manager and click on uh, the visibility and on lock. Um, okay, so now we have everything here in our object manager and our eyes are over here, left and right eye groups. And, um, oops, I lost them, here they are. Okay, so as you can see, uh, we have our cloner of this just this uh, simple uh, cylinder and uh, it's cloned and then it has a plane effector. This plane effector, what it's doing is just playing with uh, not the position, scale or rotation, but the visibility of the clones. And the cool thing here is that in the follow -up tab, you can play around with a list of uh, fields. So uh, this field over here is a box field, and this one is the one that is doing the, the, the work for the movement of the pupil. It's just a, a box field. And uh, let me bring it to visibility so that we can see that. And uh, there it is. There it is. There is the, the box field, as you can see. And uh, for, the, for the blink, we had to go into a little bit more of trouble, but not so much. Uh, we have this piece of geometry that we called left lead and let me turn it on and as you can see it's just a piece of geometry and it has a postmorph tag. The postmorph tag of course as you all know it allows you to change the well the aspect of a, of a polygon and, and to model it in several ways. So um, what we did is we connected this up to our user data and this object is as well in the list of the follow tab of the plane effector. So wherever this um, piece of geometry is, it will turn on the clones and it will turn off the clones that are outside of it. And, uh, and that's basically it. That's the way that we that we managed to, to pull off this, this, this VFX. The mirror scene was without any doubt the most challenging um, script requirement we had to face. And um, well, the, the storyboard said that she was in her bedroom and uh, while she suddenly heard this music coming out of the mirror she approached her her mirror in the wall and uh, suddenly the mirror started to to make these ripples like this wobble effect and a hand came out of of the mirror grabbed her wrapped her and pulled her in and uh, we tried different effects to achieve this and we didn't like most of them uh, and then we remembered that cinema 4d has this amazing cool feature called the volume measure and the volume builder which does this mm, melting or meshing together of, of polygons and uh, we tried this and this is what we came up with and uh, what we did is uh, we we brought into our scene uh, a second character and uh, here it is hierarchy and I'm going to pull out so that you can see him over there, we made him very big and uh, we just needed his hand, so he looks very funny, but 
we had no trouble with that because we were only going to see the hand in the mirror. And uh, what we did with Eric is we just animated his, his hand, just uh, opening the fingers and uh, grabbing her uh, and pulling her in. Um, so then what we needed to do is blend this geometry of, of the hand with the geometry of the surface of the mirror. Uh, but we ran into, a tro into, a, into an issue because we weren't able of just parenting to the body of Araki, the volume measure and the volume builder. Uh, for some reason, the skin deformer or the tags, we don't know why, but things would just not work out. So, uh, what we figured out how to do uh, this effect was that we just selected the mesh of the body and we went to file and we export this particular mesh, this, yeah, this object, to an Alembic file. And the, uh, the thing that you have just to remember here is just to, to leave this checkbox of the selection only parameter checked and hit OK. And with that, you are going to be left with uh, this other mesh. Let me get rid of the visibility of Araki here and uh, fold it in. And, and yeah, so this is the mesh that we were left off with uh, Araki body. It is an alembic file. And uh, so this allowed us to just place it as a child of the volume builder and the volume measure with the surface of the mirror which itself has a formula effector that it's the one that is doing the the ripples uh, let me put the visibility of my bfx there it is so as you can see we have the the volume builder and the volume measure here's the hand here's the the formula effector working on the on the surface of the mirror and we just played around with the parameters of the of the volume builder and the volume measure, and the, uh, which are very very simple. And uh, just like that, we were left up with this very very cool effect that allowed us to to blend between the two surfaces and and do this very incredible uh, piece of, of of effect. For this last part of the presentation, I would like to talk to you about three tips regarding post-production. Number one, subdivision surface. When and how to use it makes all the difference. This is perhaps one of the most important tips I want you to take out of this presentation. I sometimes see people putting a lot of meshes in their object manager into subdivision surfaces, like one subdivision surface for every mesh. And um, this can turn out as something not so efficient. What we found here in the studio is that you can have a lot of meshes and you can put them together, you can group them to together with option G into a null. And this null you can put it into a subdivision surface. I'm sorry, I'm going to undo that and like that yes and I can get rid of this uh, subdivision surface and this one as well and now I just have one generator doing all the job and this becomes very efficient and uh, let me show you what we did here I have uh, an example of a scene and as you have been able of, of seeing in, in all this presentation we of course have this order for for our scenes and uh, uh, let me show you, for example, here we have a character. I'm going to bring into the object manager the meshes and I'm going to unlock them. So as you can see, the meshes of the character have not only the body of the character, but it has the eyes, the bell, the tongue, the teeth, the mouth, the hair, all these pieces of geometry. But all of these pieces of geometry, all of these meshes are grouped within this null that itself is a child of this subdivision surface. And this is the way that all the character just gets subdivided with just one click. 
and this is very convenient for the render department and uh, let me explain a little bit further uh, when you're animating uh, you really need things not to be subdivided so that you can have a fast workflow and as you can see I'm going to lock my my set so that I can select my controllers uh, I am not on a fast machine really and I am being able of navigating without any trouble and making keyframes and moving my controllers around and undoing and this is this is very I mean for a, for a scene that has five characters in it and a fairly complex layout well this is a very good workflow um, and this is because none of the characters and the set has subdivision um, like uh, on right now the subdivision is off and this is the reason why animators can do things with with a good flow but then of course comes the the moment when you have to render your scene and uh, so what we did was a uh, simple user data in the god controller which is this uh, little uh, purple controller in each of the characters and what this user data does is that it has a, a connection to the subdivision surface and as you can see it subdivides the characters so what the render department did was they clicked on this um, magnifying glass I suppose <laughs> and hit and typed in God and here we have all the God controllers so if we would go to attributes and go uh, to and select uh, each one of these um, controllers, we could very fastly uh, subdivide all of the characters and the scene would be ready to render. And this, as you can see, becomes a very fast production workflow for the animators. And uh, it turns out as a, a very fast production workflow for the render department as well. Save your breath. Compositing tag, external compositing tag, and Cineware. The utmost joy of not having to track or rotoscope ever again. Okay, so here we are at the police station of Sugar Dream City. And uh, the challenge we had to face here uh, was that this, this red character over here called Chief Seuss, the chief of police, he had to transform his head into a screen and uh, a video had to appear on that screen. So to troubleshoot that, what we did is we, we animated uh, this um, like a transforming of the head into another prop that was this screen. And, um, and then we uh, used this relationship with After Effects that allows you to, to, to put video inside of, of certain objects. And this you do with the compositing tag. So let me show you. I'm going to open my props and here is the, the screen. But I have to go to my layer manager and I have, I have to put in, in the object manager the, the meshes and unlock them. And now, uh, here I have my screen. I'm going to zoom in. And here it is. I'm going to, to show it to you. This is the object, right? And what we did is we put this tag called the compositing tag. Uh, the way you do this is you just right click, you go to render tags, and here it is, compositing tag. Now this tag, in its attributes, uh, has this object buffer tab, and uh, you just have to choose whatever number you want here, and you just have to make sure in your render settings that you check multipass, and here in this little bu multipass button, you have to click on an object buffer. And this way, you will drop to this list uh, any amount of object buffers that you want. So as you can see, this one has the number 11, just as, as we have it here in the, in the Attributes Manager. And uh, so that's it. That's all that we have to do in, in, in Cinema 40. Oh, and one more thing. You have to make sure that here in the save um, 
parameter of the render settings, you choose a open EXR format for your render because this format will allow you in After Effects, inside of After Effects, to do something very cool. Let me show you. So here we are in After Effects and we are left off with this render, which is the EXR render that is, uh, well, the, the render itself. And uh, on top of that, I placed the image that I, wasn't, I had to put inside of that screen. So the only thing that we have to do in After Effects is select the render. I'm going to hit Command D to duplicate and I'm going to drop it on top of that image. Now, with this uh, layer selected, I'm going to Effect, 3D Channel, and go to Extractor. This is a native effect of After Effects. And here we are left up with this layer uh, drop menu. And here we have our Object Buffer 11. So I just select it. And as you can see, our screen now is something that is completely white against all the rest of the scene that is completely black. And what this allows you to do inside of After Effects is that you can use it as a trackmate. So uh, we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to select this image uh, below and we are going to the track mat column and we're going to select Luma Mat. And just like that, the image will restrain uh, to that specific uh, screen object that we selected in uh, Cinema 4D. And you, Rosebud! The external compositing tag is one of the best things that, ha that can happen to you if you hate tracking just as much as I do. And uh, the, the directors of the show wanted us to put light inside of, of these sirens, of these robots. And the way that we did this uh, is as follows. Uh, let me go to my layer manager and I'm going to click here so that I can bring my meshes and unlock them. And uh, we had to put in this null object called Silent Light. And uh, because we had to put it here, and let me tell you, this is very important. We thought that this little guy, we could be able of, of putting it inside of the head rig, but it turned out that we couldn't because for the external compositing tag to work, uh, which is this guy over here, this guy is going to send the information of the coordinates of this object into After Effects. But it is very important that this object has global coordinates and any object that is inside of this head controller has local coordinates. So we would be left off with no coordinates whatsoever. So we needed to figure out a way around this. And uh, what we came up with was with this Expresso, very simple Expresso, that just takes the global position and the global rotation of this object um, right here and just sends it to this object right there. And uh, this way, now the external compositing tag can take this information and send it to After Effects. So the way that this works uh, in this scene, and uh, let me show you, uh, we have uh, our set, our characters, our props, everything as I have shown you in this presentation. And here in our characters, we have the, the robot dog. Let me go to my layer manager and I'm going to bring the meshes to the object manager. And here we have the siren light. And as you can see, we have the path that this object now is, is following. If I go to its attributes, here in the coordinates tab, I have all this uh, changing in the position and the rotation globally and this information can be sent out to After Effects thanks to this compositing, external compositing tag and the way that you set this composite, external compositing tag is that you just have to right click on the object you have to go to render tags and here you have external compositing and uh, we just left it as it is, as a solid object. And um, 
And if, if we were to go now to After Effects, as you can see, uh, what is very, very convenient about the relationship that has been going on for the past few years between Cinema 4D and After Effects is that you can import a Cinema 4D file into After Effects. And this is the case that we did here. Let me make a quick example. I am just dragging this Cinema 4D file into a new composition and we can see our Cinema 4D file inside of After Effects. And uh, in order for us to see those external compositing nodes that we created in Cinema, we just have to click on Extract. And automatically, uh, After Effects will bring those external compositing nodes as layers. So here in my scene, I have my camera and I have my, my node. And as you can see, I have that same path that I had back in, in Cinema 4D. Now I have it in After Effects. And this way I can just put a flare and this flare will follow the, the siren of the robot perfectly. And, and that's just a beauty for all of those who, who just like me, don't like to, to track at all. Um, one last thing about this, I have to make the question if any of you out there know the answer to. Um, in the past, where, what, what, what I used to do with, with this object is I, I had to use the cappuccino. Uh, this is because in order for After Effects to understand this path, you have to create keyframes in Cinema 4D. And um, in the past, what I used to do, to do with this object is that I had to create like a keyframe for, for every frame. I just went, I selected the object, I went to animate, and here we have cappuccino. I started the real time on cappuccino and checked position, scale, and rotation, everything good. And I just clicked on an empty space. And what Cinema 4D would do is it would create a keyframe automatically for that object on every frame. But this wasn't the case in this project, so I had to go and put my keyframes frame by frame. And I wasn't able of figuring out why this was. So if any of you out there know the reason, please uh, stay for the questions and answer so that we can figure it out together. So to wrap things up, I have to talk about this amazing plugins that Regiant has created and that were life-saving for, for us in the, in the production. So for example, here we have an example of uh, the No Light Factory that we used in this scene that I showed you earlier of the, of the robots. We used this amazing flares. Uh, of no, no light factory for them. Uh, in this other scene, there's an example of the Holo Matrix, also by Red Giant, which allowed us to get this very cool look for holograms. Um, another amazing plugin is the Shine, which allows you to simulate volumetric lighting without having to render them, which takes a long time. This is the Stargo, um, also of, of the Trapco family uh, by Red Giant, uh, which allowed us to create this amazing glowing uh, neons in the city. And finally, well, one of my favorites, which is the Trapco Particular, which, well, it creates particle simulations very efficiently and uh, with, with great great results. I would like to thank Sugar2020 for trusting us with this amazing project and experience and letting us be part of it. I would also like to thank Paul Bab and Frederick Kukert and everybody in Maxon for all the support through the years. And finally, thanks to the artists and all the talent that put their hearts and minds into every single day of the production. If you are a 3D artist or animator and want to join the team, please reach out to us at this mail or Instagram account.